thus continued on with some of the things that were happening earlier in the healing and in the manner healing. And I know we've all been trained in a lot of different things, but here is what you need to look for. Is it working? How often is it working? Because I, I tell you that what I have found to work is what I'm trying to teach you. I mean, I don't go pray for everybody just because they say they need prayer. I don't, I don't move on something just because they tell me I have to do that. I have to find out from the Lord what to do. Jesus passed whole cities and didn't walk into any and touch anybody or deal with anybody. Now, they could all have been Gentiles, for all I know, and he just came for the lost house of Israel. <laughs> but, you know, the, the fact is, is that there's times that I have had people call me live on radio needing prayer that have been bedridden for 18 years. And God, before I even start to open my mouth, says, don't even ask me. Now, I don't know what's going on in between that person and, and God and their relationship, but obviously it's something that is not any of my business. Because God never told me why or why or why I shouldn't pray for him. And, you know, it would be in our nature to go ahead and do it anyway. Because that's got to be the devil. I rebuke you. And it happens a lot more than you might think that you're rebuking God rather than Satan. Because we have in our mindset, we think it's this way and this way only. That mold has to be broken in order to get where we're going. That's why... <laughs> Lord said, get it right, and my power will be released. Even in greater measure, it will come. Because the fact is, a lot of things we've been taught sound good and keep you busy and make you feel involved and all that. But we want what works. We want to see manifestations 100% of the time because we did it the way God said do it. Now, if God's having you do it a different way, that's the way you should do it. Because I'm not telling you Kent's way is the only way. But I'm saying, any way you do do it, it has to come from the same source. The same source I got it, the same source you got it. But you have to do it his way, not the way man taught you, or not the way you assume. Assumption is destroying the church. We assume that God's going to do what we want him to do. I mean, I find it interesting how many people are just like, you mean I can ask God how to fix it rather than tell him? You know, he, he's made it real clear. And, he, and I'm, he basically shouted from heaven to me and said, I am sick and tired of people telling me what to do. Now, you think about that a minute. How many times in your prayer have you told God what you need him to do? <laughs> he's not our servant. He's not our butler. You know, he's king, Lord, master of all. And it'll really change your prayer life. All of a sudden you realize, wow, I've been praying that way because I can't seem to pray the way he's saying to pray. What can I do for you, Lord? What do you need me to do for you today? Not what he needs to do for me. He showed me years ago in a setting on a church I was sitting in and the pastor was at the pulpit and he was praying. And in a vision, I see Jesus go and bow before the pulpit and he said, take, Lord, we need you to fix Aunt Ruth's roof, it needs to be fixed, and she has not the money. Jesus would run out of the room. Then he start praying again. Here comes Jesus back at the altar again. And what he was showing me, he says, if I did what you tell on me and what you're praying, this is what it would look like. Does that look like the right picture to you? No. When we talk about all you need to know to be a Christian is to pray, hear, and obey. There's a lot of things to learn just in the first thing. Pray. How are you praying? And the fact is, is if, you, if you're working in an area where you're seeing that you know that you know when you're knower, that person's going to be healed because it's God, not because you're faking it. Are you mustering it up? <laughs> then you will see the effect of that, whatever God says, but you can't add to it. You can't subtract from it. There's times God will tell you that person has, you know, whatever, stomach cancer, whatever it is. And you're immediately going to assume, I'm supposed to pray for your healing. No. No. You don't assume anything. You wait until you hear the Lord tell you what to do. Because you may find that the Lord says, don't say a word. Walk over there and hit him in the stomach. I don't know if you've ever seen any videos 
uh, Ed Cole, Jack Cole, Jack Cole, back in the old days when he would minister. Some of those videos, he took little old women that were so frail, and they came up for back healing, and he'd get behind and put his knee in their back, pull them back. I mean, just crack them. You know, you're thinking, man, that's scary. Smith Wigglesworth. Once on the stage, a lady brought a baby up in a shoebox that had no legs or no arms. And he laid that baby down on the end of the stage, walked back a few feet, and then punted it out to the congregation. Now, you talking about a man better know what he's talking about, what he's doing. Because you're going to have a mob after you if this doesn't work. But when they caught the baby, it had arms and legs. Now, that's recorded. Personally, I have spent time with Dr. Lester Summerall, the late Dr. Lester Summerall. Dinner with him, spent days with him. He even prayed for me, laying hands on me. And the reason why I asked him to lay hands on me and part it to me the gift of faith is because I knew he had sat at the feet of Smith Circlesworth when he was in World War I. And he had listened to him teach him of all these things when he was in the war. And so I asked him a lot of things about what Smith Circlesworth would teach and how he acted and what he was and what kind of man he was and how did he move it. It's all the same thing. It's always the same thing. He heard God and he did what God told him to do and it always worked. I mean, you know, sometimes it seems like this is just too simple. We got to make this thing a little bit more difficult. This is just so simple that all you got to do is hear and do what he says and that's going to work. You know what the problem is? We want to be in control. We want to have God's control. We want to we want to do it, make God do it the way we want to do it. It won't work. It just won't work. I remember there was a time when we were traveling with a group of people who were just starting out to learn how to hear God and prophesy. And, and back in that day, I mean, even Gay remembers this. We had 15 pastor band. We'd travel all over the place in Texas, going to different churches. And this one night, everybody was getting ready and they all came to the house. And we all got in a circle, started praying. But this lady had come with a, another couple and she was blind, had her red and white striped cane. And, and I didn't know her, I hadn't met her before. And so we're in a prayer circle and God says, spit in her face and I'll heal her eyes. I thought, wait a minute, Lord, you know, we were on prayer. I mean, let's talk about this. But I, I don't even know this lady. You know, we go spit in her face. Now here's what I'm talking about the pool of Bethesda, the troubling of the water. I, I thought about it too long and the time passed just like that. If I'd have moved on it right then, I know that I know in my knower she would have her sight. In fact, I made the mistake of telling her while I was helping her down the steps to go to her car, what God told me. And all of a sudden she picked up that cane and was swinging it, trying to hit me. She couldn't see me, you know, but thankfully. But she wanted to hit me because she was mad. She wanted me to spit in her face. Why didn't you spit in my face? From that point on, I learned right then, well, you don't hesitate. And whatever God wants you to do, you do it. I remember uh, a prophet in Georgia that Wes knows or knew. He's passed on now. But God had him get down and kiss a man's old green, dry, total. It's growing, growing, you know, it's all nasty looking. Maybe get down there and kiss it, to heal it. You know, being a servant of God isn't always a glorious thing, is it? <laughs> but if it works, What's more important, that uncomfortable point in time or that man <coughs> having his healing? You know, it's all about doing it his way. It always has been. And, you know, that's another part of that when we come to the place where we say, you know, what is the word of God? And, you know, just one little cliche saying this is the word of God has led people to worship the book rather than the one the book is about. Even to the point to where there's been massive teachings and whole movements that teach you all you got to do is go find a promise, claim it, and you'll have it. Even to the point where they say, command ye me. I know somebody started a church, and it's called, command ye me. I said, what do you mean, command ye me? Command the Lord what to do, what is written, because he's bound to it. Oh, my God. What I mean. Are you, you're all messed up here, because that's going to get you in big trouble. You don't command God to do anything. I mean, what, what, where do we come from? You know, you're talking about the creator of the universe. And who are we? We're nothing but a, an ant amongst billions of ants. 
one wrong move and we're stomped out, you know? I, I'm just, the fear of the Lord is a good thing, people. What I'm giving you is the fear of the Lord because it's the beginning of wisdom. Not our wisdom, but wise enough to know that it is he who does it all, not us. Now, I know that when you come up to a point in your life where God says, I can trust you now, I'm going to give unto you an angel to minister for you. Now, what happens in that? Now, all of a sudden, that angel's at your disposal. And that angel's connected to a certain thing he's going to minister for you in. And whenever you need that angel, he'll be there as long as you go through the proper protocol. In the beginning, when I started out, I had to pray, preach, and prophesy. I had to pray to find out what to preach. And when I preached what God had me preach, the gift of prophecy came. The angel came. And I would preach until that angel showed up. And I would know it. And some people would wonder, how long is it going to take? And sometimes I thought the same, but as soon as he did, I stopped whatever I was saying. He's here. Now we can start ministering. But I couldn't minister any time before that or it'd just be me. So they were willing to wait. And then here we go. I've been in meetings where the angel's ministering, talking to me, and I'll tell you how I got to that point too, because some people say, I thought you heard God. I do hear God. Angel's a messenger of God. <laughs> You know, God doesn't come down here and stand next to me. He doesn't have to. That's why he's got messengers. But it's still his word nonetheless. If an ambassador from Russia came to the president of this United States and told him something, he would believe it came from the man in Russia that's in charge, right? So why would it be any different in the kingdom of heaven? Even more so. So anyway, <laughs> you know, you, you're, you're in a setting where you're prophesying one person after another, after another, lined up. All of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I see this white streak go out of the room, and it's over. And I had to stop. I said, look, I can't do any more. And the pastor and the elders said, why not? Why not? I said, well, that, that person that's right behind the one I was ministering to just quenched the Holy Spirit, and he left. Oh, no, no, not him. He's a prophet, too. It wasn't him. It was the girl you were prophesying to. She's, you know, messed up. So no, it was the guy right behind me. And they continued to disagree, but I wasn't going to argue. You know, I thought, well, I'll just go on. It doesn't matter to me. It's your church anyway. Your responsibility. So a few weeks later went by, and the pastor called me and says, hey, you know, uh, that incident where you said the, the angel left the room? I said, yeah. He said, well, that prophet you talked about, and you blamed it on him? I said, yeah. He said, well, you got to get to a confession this morning to the whole church and ask for forgiveness for running off the, the angel of the Lord that came into the house because he was jealous. You know, and I'm thinking, okay, how simple is it to run away the Holy Spirit? How simple is it to quench the Holy Spirit? How, I mean, if you quench the Holy Spirit, what do you think happens? A lot of withdrawal comes. The angels go up. Who's in charge of all those angels? The Holy Spirit. Uh, they refer to as ministering spirits. Who are they ministering under? The Holy Spirit. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, there's a difference between us and angels. We know that. Angels can do things we can't do, but they don't have what we have. And whenever you begin, there's another part, part we get to. We're talking about divine order today. Again, there's a lot in divine order that we're, we're trying to crash through to get through as quickly as we can. When divine order works in this manner, this is one thing I've learned recent is that when you begin to pray in tongues and pray in your heavenly language, you are sending out angels as the Lord gives unto you interpretation of what's going on. You will know what God's saying. Paul says, when you pray, pray that you also ask the Lord to make your mind fruitful of things you don't understand what you're saying. So before you start praying in tongues, ask the Lord to make your mind fruitful. So when you're praying in tongues, it's just like Paul said, you'll pray in tongues and then all of a sudden you'll pray in your understanding. Then you'll pray and tongues, and then you pray in your you know, natural language. And what it does is it helps you identify what the Holy Spirit's saying. You're saying it for your benefit in your language. But when you're speaking it in the Holy, in the holy Tongues, the angels are going and doing God's bidding. For when his word is spoken, they do his word according to Psalms 103, verse 20. So there, you know, people always wonder, how do you send out your angel? I knew it wasn't you just say, go, fetch it, you know, or, you know, <laughs> whatever terminology you want to use. There had to be something there. 
there had to be something more to it. And so that's when I learned that whenever I began to pray in my heavenly language, there's angels about doing God's bidding, doing whatever it is God's wanting to do. And it, it could be for me or it could be for the people. You know, it doesn't, doesn't really matter as long as they're doing what God's wanting to do. And that's what they're going to do. Now, how do we judge angels? <laughs> you know, that's another, another thing altogether. Because you need to judge angels now. Is this a demonic angel? Is this a fallen angel? Or is this an angel in right standing with God? Now you're thinking, where did that come from? It does say in the scriptures where we have, we have the same authority over fallen angels as we do heavenly angels. Now, think about this. Whenever Jesus told the disciples, when you go into a city, and if they don't receive you, knock the dust off your feet, it'll be worse for them than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah, they, they, went, they, they, went out, they went out under bad. It was not good. And, you know, I realized that, you know, even when the Holy Spirit uh, came upon Herod, when he wouldn't give glory to God for the things God did, he was struck by worms by the Holy Spirit. Now you're saying, well, God, that's not right. That's not right. That doesn't fit. You know, Satan's the one that does all the stealing, killing, and destroying here. Well, you probably so, but you know, who does he use to do it? There, there's a lot of things that are gonna open up in this whole can of worms we got here, and you're gonna see some things come out that's gonna go against your doctrine, you're gonna go against what you taught. But let me ask you this: is everything working for you that you've been taught? then something's not right. And God's saying, get it right. Because he wants to send us more power. But we can't receive that power until we are knowledgeable enough to know what to do with it and know what he's doing. But the simple fact, things can happen bad in your life when you start rebuking God. You can be headed for a meeting, and all of a sudden you got a flat tire. You're out there kicking it, rebuking Satan and everything else. Next thing you know, somebody pulls over to help you. And you're talking to them while they're changing your flat for you, changing tires for you, and, and you start witnessing to them and they receive the Lord. And you manage to get to your meeting and that person was late and you were both there at the same time. So what, what's the deal? What's the big deal here? I mean, we got to chill out, people. If you feel rushed to do something, you feel pressured to do something, it is not God. It is not God. If you feel that stress to be pushed to go be somewhere at a certain time, do something at a certain time, or be impulsed to buy it now, they're going to run out. Don't do it. God doesn't do that, but the enemy does. He'll do anything to push you in the way of traffic that'll bring you harm. There's a lot of things for us to learn. Also, I'm going to get into some things right quick that maybe some of us will understand what I'm talking about. I know you will, brother. There are things, you're from, you came from the Congo? Yeah. You know, there are signs that you, that communicate to the spirit realm, communicate to the angelic as well as the fallen angels. And some of these things, just like knocking the dust off your feet. Now, when I do that, I just take my foot and rub it on the back of my calf, on my other leg, right? Knock the dust off. That's the way I'm doing it. Now, that's a symbol that you would think, what, what does that mean? It is a sign. It is a spiritual sign. Something's going to take place. You know what this means? You reject it. You denounce it. It's off of me. There's, there's all kinds of signs, even to the place to where you will find even a shadow. I had a place come up cancerous on my head. I put my finger there. The Lord said, do this. The shadow healed it, and it's gone the next day. So, you know, I'm saying there's things that you do. Sometimes it don't make any sense. Why am I doing what I'm doing? They're not just gestures of nervous condition. <laughs> they are actually manifestations of communication, if you will, sign language to the, the angelic beings. And, you know, we haven't had much understanding about what angels are, what they do, what their functions are, because they've been mainly rejected because most, most of the churches, most of the ministers 
said that's all New Age stuff. Well, they got it probably out of the New Testament too, because if you look at the New Testament alone, you'll find angels all over the place doing things. Even if you get to the book of Revelation, the very first chapter talks about an angel visiting John on the island of Patmos and began to give him the visions of what he was going to happen. When you prophesy, you're hearing an angel, because what happens when you receive that gift of prophecy, an angel was appointed unto you to minister for you, and he ascends and descends from the throne of God, bringing you the message of what to say. And who to say it to? It's easy. It's easy. There's no strain in this. All you're doing is opening yourself up to be a vessel for God to speak through. You're nothing more than a conduit, a source for him to flow through you, for it to be spoken on earth so it will be done. Why didn't God just say it from heaven and it be done? There's obviously a reason, but I don't know the answer to that question yet. But why doesn't he just speak it and say it? He spoke it to create it. And then he spoke whenever Adam and Eve were in the garden, but as soon as they believed Satan rather than God, God didn't say much more. And then you could you could follow through so much of Genesis all the way to the Revelation and see angels all the way through from the beginning to the end. And even beyond that point, because now we're in an encounter of angelic visitation that is intensifying daily. How many times do you look at Facebook and see something in the clouds and say, wow, man, that's a good Photoshop there. Maybe not. More so, probably not. And if you've ever seen an angel and that angel speak to you, you'll see them in a totally different form than what you ever imagined them to be. Because they take on any form they so need. They can be whoever they want to. They can do whatever they want to. They can take on the form of a dog to go save a child out of a, a, mash, a, a raging river. You know what I mean? They, it doesn't, they're not limited. But yet we always see them in a nice little gown and wings and maybe a harp or two, you know. It's just, but those are only symbolic for the fact that they fly. They can soar through the clouds like crazy. They can move from one place, they can transcend, they can be there for one moment and puff, they're gone. You don't even see them anymore. And I'm not talking about something I read, I'm talking about something I've lived, experienced. Because experience is the best teacher. Experience is a teacher that will stick with you the rest of your life. Experience will separate you from those who believe and, and to those who know. And there's a difference whenever we say, even when we process sometimes we think, when we say we think, God would say this, I draw caution because I'm wanting you to know. Because what that says to me is, I know this is what you're hearing from God because you told me. Now, I know sometimes it comes as, as like Paul said, like looking through a glass dimly. You know, you ever tried to look in the mirror after a hot shower and you try to see yourself, you can't make it out. Sometimes it is like that. So I can understand the terminology, but where we have to get is get to the place where we know. Because it's not enough to hear God, you gotta know what he means. There's a lot of things God says and you look at it and you wonder, why did you say it that way? That doesn't even say what I think you want me to do. We were talking at breakfast this morning about one of my daughters that, you know, she was on a date and I was supposed to go pick her up at the mall where the movie house was. And I'm watching TV and all of a sudden the woman says, uh, you know, a lot of parents are late picking up their children. Okay. Okay. He doesn't say anymore. So I have to work with what I've got. So what is he saying? He's saying be early. Now, would you communicate that out of that? I mean, I mean, it's the way he thinks. Just like in Revelation 19 and 10, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Well, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Does that mean if I just testify to Jesus, that's prophecy? No. What it's saying is, Whenever someone prophesies, it's a testimony that Jesus is not dead. He's alive. He's speaking to you and I. There's more depth than what we're reading. There's more depth than what we're seeing. And God controls that, how much he's going to let you see. And he's ready to let you see a lot. But you have to be on his same frequency. 
You have to be dialed into him, not what somebody else said, but what's God saying to you? I'm not telling you to do it my way. The only thing I am telling you, do it his way. And all I'm saying over and over again is this is what God said to me to do, and I did it, and this is what's worked. It's the testimony of what Jesus has done over and over and over again to the place to where you can trust it. Now, I started out when I was a young child, and I'd be laying in bed, and I said, God, why'd you make feet so ugly? And so he says, how would you make them? Well, I started thinking about it. I thought, well, let's see. I'd get a vision of a claw and then a chicken's foot and then a, you know, <laughs> not a dog paw. And a, those are, none of those are free either. And I, and I said, and they said, see, you only work with what you know. You can only work with what you know. So you need to know more. And once you know truth, you can't unknow truth. And nobody can take it from you. Now, the quest is, is how to explain it. How do I communicate it? How do I get people to understand it? Because when you have a call on your life to spread it and to share it, because it's all about leading people to Jesus. I mean, all I'm doing is evangelizing here, getting you closer to the Lord, closer to the Lord. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Let's lay down all our theologies and go with one thing, his word. Not his word then to them, but his word to you now. This was his word to someone else, right? But you can't go claim someone else's word any more than we can do the recordings here of your prophecy. I don't like that, but I'm going to go get, you know, uh, Harriet's over here. I like hers better. It's the same thing. It is. Now, God can speak to you through this book because he called me to the ministry out of this book because it's the only thing I knew at the time. And when he called me out of this, he confirmed it over and over and over and over again until finally... You know, I had to give in. Somewhere had to, something had to give because it wasn't going to keep going the way it was because it wasn't getting pretty at all. I was going to go one way or the other, either the hard way or the easy way, and I took it about as close as hard as you can get. <laughs> but I learned a lot in the process to tell you, don't go that way. <laughs> just, just go ahead and give it up. It'll be better for you. God doesn't care about your reputation. He doesn't care about your accuracy. He doesn't care so much about even whether you make money at it. You understand what I'm saying? Now, he'll help you and tell you how to find the support you need. But you still have to move through the process. Lord, there's so much. Sometimes he can download so much into you, you feel like you're going to bust. And when he starts talking to you about where you're at, Father, I'll just release all of this that you're putting in me, Lord. I just send it out now. Lord, I send it out now to each spirit in this house. And every spirit that's not of you, Lord, it has to get out. It has to get out now. Lord, it is my desire, my hope, and my greatest pleasure in doing what you ask me to do. But, Lord, I don't know how sometimes. How do I get it into there? How do I engraft this message? How do I engraft this, this lifestyle, Lord, of walking in the supernatural? Lord, how do I do this? Because, Lord, I know what it's going to be like when they walk out of this place. And Lord says, don't doubt in darkness what you do commit to in the light. Don't doubt in darkness what you commit to in the light. Whatever you commit to in him now, when you walk out of this, you're going to be attacked. You're going to be told many ways, even through ambassadors of Satan, come to you in the flesh and tell you, you can't do that. That won't work. You have to resist it. You have to choose whom you're going to believe, whether you're going to believe what the Lord is saying to you or you're going to believe what the enemy is telling you not to believe. You've got a desire. You have to have a desire to want to do it God's way. I mean, most of us are in a place to where we're saying, you know, Lord, we can't go another day like this. We need a breakthrough now. Lord, I need, I need to see something happen now in my life. I need something to happen to my children right now, Lord. I need something to happen in my business right now. 
I need I need things to start happening. Lord says, I'm waiting on you. Just waiting on you. You're the instrument I'll use to change it all. But I'm going to do it through you because I'm not going to come down there and do it for you. It's all there for you to receive. It's all there for you to begin to start moving into. And you'll deal with it all different kinds of ways. You'll have things happen to you and you'll think, man, that was really a messed up deal. Don't blame it on God. Just get back in the race and say, teach me how, Lord. Tell me what you mean. Even the disciples who walk with him, hearing him with their own ears in the natural, him speaking to him as a man there, and they still said, speak plainly. We don't understand what you're saying. How much more challenging is it for us who have to hear him spirit to spirit? Some of us are just now finding out we have one. So we need to begin to develop that because in the spirit is where all the blessings are. All the answers are in your spirit. The, all the knowledge of the universe that lives within you. There's nothing that is hidden that shall not be revealed, it says in Mark 4 and 24. And to he who has an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And if you do what the Spirit of the Lord is saying, he will give more to you. But if you don't do what he says, he'll even take what you have and give it to another who, who has more. You want to get more? Just pick up the pieces that other people are leaving behind. Just be willing, Lord, I'll, I'll pick it up. I'll carry it. Because many times God looks around and he says, who will do what I'm asking them to do? I need to take care of this situation. Who can I trust to go do it? I remember a time when I was driving to the back of the bank for lunch, and I came through a four-way stop sign. I stopped the stop sign, and right on the opposite corner was First Baptist Church. And the Lord said so clearly, he said, will you give my church $75,000? I said, hmm. I said, Lord, I don't, I don't have that, but if you, if you want me to sell something, whatever you need me to do, just tell me and I'll do it. And I drove on to the bank. Time went by and the Lord led me to Beulah's house, which I told you earlier yesterday about how he sent me over to buy the five acres to build a shopping center that she wasn't going to sell to me. But all of a sudden now she says she's going to do it. She doesn't know why. We know why. But then the Lord left a quarter million dollars profit there just in the land by to be able to pay him $75,000 to the church. He made a way. My mistake was I got so busy I forgot about it. Yeah, you're saying, yo, how is that possible? Yeah, it was busy, but yet... It should have been on the front foot. Like David said, I put the word of the Lord on my forehead. And what he put on there was his word, you'll be king. So no matter whether you're standing before a bear or a lion or a glide, you're not king yet, so you know you got this one. And you know the same thing applies to each and every one of us. Your word hasn't been fulfilled yet, you need to keep going. Nothing can stop you as long as you hold on to that word. I didn't... I didn't come to that place to where I could do that. Then I was in a place where I couldn't financially do that. So then what do you do? Deuteronomy 28 lists a whole list of blessings for those who hear God and obey. A longer list of curses for those who hear God and don't obey. So back to the fear of the Lord again. People, if you're going to walk in this, you better walk in it right. God doesn't mess around. He wants you to do it his way. No assumptions, no assuming, no guessing, no thinking, just doing. But you got to know how he wants you to do it and when he wants you to do it. It's just as important to know when as it is what. Because you may think you know what he wants you to do, but you better ask him to confirm it and continually keep checking in with him on it. Am I right? Is this right? Am I doing it right? If I'm wrong, please tell me, show me, stop me. Because most of us get his word and we go out. Next thing you know, we've got this blueprint made up and we're, we're going to build this whole campus and everything. That's the first word you ever got from God. No. First thing that usually comes from God is go stand on a street corner and wait for me. And nobody ever comes by. And you wonder why. Just see if you would. Doesn't mean something has to come of it just because God said do it. Because he's going to test you in it. He's going to try. He's going to get to the place where he can trust you before he gives you major things to do. 
before you can accept the phone call that says we got a missing child, can you help us find it? And they're talking about spiritually using something they don't have or solving a murder or just finding someone's lost cat. I mean, you know, so it's not any different finding the cat or finding the murderer. I mean, it's the same process. One's not bigger than the other. We only make it that way in our own minds. Same way with sickness and disease. And they go, this is major, man. This is going to take special prayer. Maybe not. Maybe it's already done. All you got to do is declare it. But you got to find out. And you know, it's not a struggle. Here's the way you do it. You say, God, this person needs a healing. They have stage four cancer. They're not expected to but 30, 60 days best. Lord, what do I do? And then forget about it. That's the hard part. Get it out of your head. Because as long as you're playing in your head, thinking it, you're interrupting God. You're trying to fix it. He said, okay, when you stop it, I'll do something. When you get out of the way, I'll tell you what to do. You know how it is when you have your children try to get up there with you and make a pie <laughs> or whatever it is you're working on? Or you got a boy out there trying to mow the lawn with you and you're afraid you're going to cut his foot off? That's how we get with God sometimes. We're just in his way. We just need to step back and wait until he calls us to do what it is. And when he calls you, you'll know it's him because you're not even thinking about it now. Now all of a sudden the answer comes and I wasn't even thinking about it. That's easy to know when it's God. But when you're constantly thinking about it and you're going through the process of figuring out all the ways God's going to do this, believe me, all the ways you figure he's going to do it, he'll not do one of them at all. He'll prove to you he has a way you don't even know. And usually it'll be the most simple way. And you think, wow, why don't I think of that? So just give it up, let it go, and go on your way. And then he comes to you. Now we're told to do something different. We're told to go nag God in prayer until he gives in. <laughs> Good luck with that. <coughs> You're not going to talk God down, really. You're not going to bend him over until he says, oh, I can't handle it anymore. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. We say a term when you pray through. And simply all that means is when I prayed and I know God's taking it. You're trying to give it to him. I plead. You know, Lord, I have this situation. I don't know what to do. Lord, will you take it from me? And tell me what I need to do. And maybe he takes it right away. Maybe he doesn't. But then you come back again and you say the same thing. Lord, you know the situation here. You know my needs before I even ask. You know the needs of my sister or brother before they even, that when they came to me, you knew it before they even came to me. You know the problem, but you have the answer. I found this a lot of times really helps. If you start bragging on God. Lord, you remember when that day I really messed up and about put the ministry in the ground and you gave me that word about 12.93%? On what I owed, and everything got paid in full for that 12.93%. Boy, that was a wonderful day. Remember that, Lord? You know what it's like when your child comes to you and they start bragging on, man, you remember that toy you bought me last Christmas? I sure like that toy. I still play with that toy. I love that toy. And then you got another child comes up. I don't like any of my stuff. You never give me anything. And I'm not, I, you give up so and so everything. I don't, I don't like him anymore just because what you do for him. Guess what you're going to get? Probably thump on the head. <laughs> but our attitude has a lot to do with how we approach God. It has everything to do with how we approach God. But in your sincerity and whatever it is that's in you, approach him in truth. I mean, if you're mad, if you're, I mean, you're just furious about what somebody did to you, go vent it to God. Do nothing else but bend it to God. I mean, unleash. Boy, I hate that scoundrel. <laughs> I mean, you just tell God honestly the way you feel. And all of a sudden, he takes it from you. 
and replaces it with something better. Also, he'll take it and he'll do something about it. Talking about the courts of heaven. Basically, what you're doing is you're pleading your case with God. Please, please take this, God. Make a judgment on this and render whoever is at fault in this correctly and justly as you always do. And Lord, if it's me, do it to me so I will learn to do better. But if it's them, please deal with them and then leave it alone. The verdict's still out there. Just wait. And then one day, all of a sudden, you'll hear something and think, wow, God, I didn't mean to be that hard. <laughs> because when God punishes somebody, you can punish them a lot harder than you ever could, believe me. I had a situation when I was in Norway. I spent a number of trips going to Norway. And I was starting churches all up and down the Norwegian area, especially in the northern part. And there was a a man who came in one day when I was meeting with all the pastors and and I said, who is that guy, you know, serving us coffee and all? I said, well, he used to have a church here. Oh, really? I said, yeah, he's got about 900 people. I said, oh, what's he doing here now? He said, well, he went back years ago to Washington State in Yakima and he started a church there and it really thrived. But then he decided to come back and start another one here. So he left that church and came here. I said, oh, okay, so I talked to him for a little bit. Then I went back to the States and I got an email one day from that fellow. We'll call him Craig. And Craig emailed me and he says, don't send any more prophecies to Norway. By the way, I had a meeting with all the pastors and I'm now taking over all the churches. So I called a few of the pastors, my key pastors, and I said, what's going on? So, well, he's convinced us that, you know, He's here and you're there, so it just seems only right that he'd do it. Now he's an American. And so, and I wept. I mean, I was really broken. I worked hard to get those churches started up and moving forward. But I just wept and then gave it to God and I left it alone. About, gosh, probably eight or nine years later, Wes was pastoring a church in Gainesville where, where I live. And, and uh, I came up to help Wes. And we went, eventually moved up there. And there was a gentleman that was there that was seeing his family. His dad was in bad health and his mom needed some help around the place. So he came from his, left his business temporarily from Yakima, Washington. He came to Gainesville to help his folks. And while he was there, Wes did a sermon that his dad, the man's dad came forward and gave his life to Christ. So that meant special to that gentleman. And he, he really took an attentive interest in Wes and the church and then Wes introduced me to him and he got introduced to prophecy and he really liked that so he got a bunch of meetings together to have prophecy meetings with men's groups and different church services and so then he had to leave his time his dad passed on and they moved on he moved his mom back to Yakima where they were from and so then he sends for me he wants me to come up there and minister to a church there and so I went up there and, and ministered there, and it, it, it was pretty good success. And he took me around and showed me all the churches that he had been part of at some point in time and told me about his mentor who had a church there that he drove me by. And he said, yeah, he was my mentor all my days. I was youth minister under him. And I didn't think too much about it, you know, just listen to the guy talking. And then later on, I'm in his office, and I look on the wall, and there's a picture and a newspaper article about that pastor that was his mentor, and it was Craig, the pastor that was in Norway that took over the churches. <laughs> Just to show you how God works, this guy, I never told him about my relationship with Greg and how I knew Greg, because I didn't want to burst his bubble. He thought greatly of this man. One day we're riding, going somewhere to I don't know what we were going to do. We were in a car. And he says, you know, I've never told anybody this, but I'm going to tell you something about my mentor, Craig, the pastor, that I never told anybody. He said, you know, when he was in Norway starting up a church, he fell into to sin with one of the elders' wives. And so they left and came back to Yakima. And he was going to try to start a church again, and it wouldn't work. And he said his wife walked in on 
and one day, and he was on his computer, but he was dead. And porn was on his computer, and he died. Humiliation, deprivation, broken hearts everywhere. But why would God make a connection with me to bring me all the way around through that, to have me there, to hear the story that he never told anybody else about the man who robbed the churches out in Mormon Lake? The fear of the Lord is real, people. Touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. You know, there is something to this that's a lot more severe than people might think. I've seen it happen many, many times. People come after a man of God or a woman of God, try to take them out, try to destroy the ministry. And if you just step back, don't do anything, God will do things that will shock you. You can't do enough harm to somebody compared to what God does when he gets angry, when he makes the verdict and casts his sentence on somebody and looses whatever on that person. It's more than they can contend with. So I'm just telling you that our God is real to the point to where he affects our lives more than you think. And he's wanting to use you as his friend as his vessel to use, to speak through, to minister through, to talk to, to have communion with, which we will do communion tonight. It's a celebration time, you know? And you need to find out where your Jesus is today. Is he still in the manger? Is he in the tomb? Or is he on the cross still? Or is he at the right hand of Almighty making intercession for you and I? the church. It makes a huge difference in where you are because people who see Jesus on the cross are continually under the gun, repenting constantly because they're always finding themselves being self-judged and holding themselves back because they never can do anything because I'm not worthy. You are worthy. He made you worthy. To say anything otherwise is to denounce what he's done. To think that he didn't fulfill it, then you're going to fulfill it with yourself, your sacrifices. You're telling God the Father, you didn't do enough. Jesus was enough of sacrifice. I have to do something on myself. I have to hurt myself. I have to make myself pay the price because Jesus didn't do enough. It's an abomination. It's an abomination. We've got to realize you are saved. You are born again. Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and it's written in his blood, and it cannot be erased. Settle it now. You have been set free forevermore, irregardless of what you do. Salvation is a good thing to have, right? You can still be a born-again, heaven-bound Christian and do sin and pay a price that you don't get saved from because you keep doing the same stupid thing over and over again. But it doesn't mean you're going to hell. How many times you hear or even think, this is hell on earth? <laughs> well, it can be, but not near quite as bad as you might think. Because just the absence of God in your life, period, is enough to say I'm in hell. For me, it is. Because if not to have God, if not to hear God, I would be trembling in fear of what's going to happen. Because once you start relying totally upon God to carry you through whatever, give you the answers when you don't know even what the question is. It's really a beautiful thing. I mean, to make it through school today, you can't trust the tutor, you can't even trust the teacher, but you can always trust the Holy Spirit. Now, I know we've probably got a little bit of time, but I'm gonna stop it now because a lot of you need to go get a cup of coffee. <laughs> or go to the sandbox, or stretch your legs. But I'm going to dismiss you in prayer. Father, I just ask that you send forth your angels today. Lord, that you bring forth these encounters that are needed to solidify and confirm the words of what I've spoken today, Lord. That you'll make it the proof, Lord, and the conviction of their hearts that what is there for them is real. It's not some story. It is a fact of reality that you are there for us to do for us as we do for you. 
And Lord, we live to serve you. And Lord, we will do it in communion tonight to bond ourselves with you in commitment to where we will be on the front lines of whatever you do in the years and months coming. So be it. Amen. Amen. Take a break now. Come back refreshed. We'll sing a song. Two.